names now. They didn't have names back then. Back then it was fastball, breaking ball. You might have a curveball or slider. Some guys had better curveballs than others. You had sinker guys, you know the ball would sink and run away. And you had cutter guys. Dave Drevecki, Woody Freeman, Jerry Royce, Andy Pet Petty, latter day Mariano Rivera. But you didn't walk out there and go, hey, this guy's got a cutter, two seamer, four seamer, sinker. I mean, there's too many names for one pitch. It's a fastball. This guy can get into your kitchen if you let him, and he lives in there because he's trying to break your back. He's trying to crowd you, and he's trying to jam you, and you know they could go out there too. So basically, you picked a side you wanted to beat him up, inside or outside. Okay. Oh, famous baseball. Baseball inside school. Okay, well, I have a little rant for you. I don't know if it's a rant. Uh, but I also grew up in Humble Park, so it was nice to hear our, uh, our knight over here mention uh, Humble Park. And that brought me back a few memories, um, especially of my introduction to baseball. I was not a big baseball fan. The best part of the Cubs games on WGN uh, were the Ham's beer commercials, as far as I was concerned. From the land of sky blue water. But I had a next door neighbor. The kid name was Gary Coombs. And his father was a bus driver who worked nights. So when I would get home from school, I would hear old man Coombs on his back porch playing the radio loudly so that he could hear the Cubs game while drinking beer before going to work. Now, Gary had a parakeet. 
And after years and years of this parakeet sitting on the enclosed back porch, listening to Gary's father talk over the broadcast on the radio about the Cubs game while drinking beer before going to work driving a CTA bus. The parakeet learned to say one thing. Ah, uh, he popped up. Actually, he would say it like this. Ah, uh, he popped up. Anyway, so that was my introduction to uh, most baseball. Uh, but then John gave me this poem last year at JB and asked me to read. Uh, it's a piece titled The Wave Land. And of course, it is a reference to T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. So, all for the literati here in the crowd. I want you to be prepared for that. A poem with apologies to T.S. Eliot The Burial of the Dead. August is the cruelest month, bringing Cubs fans into the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull right fielders with cold beer. Winter kept us warm, covering Wrigley and forgot betful snow, feeding a little hope with traded pitchers. Summer surprised us coming over Addison Street with a cup of old style. We stopped at the Cubby Bear and went on in sunlight into the bleachers and ate smoky links and talked for a few hours. I am no Sox fan from Logan Square, pure Cub. And when we were children staying at the tool and dye makers, my cousins, he took me to the upper deck and I was frightened. And he said, Tommy, Tommy, hold on tight. And down the cups went. In the grandstands, there you sit for free. I read much of the season and go south in summer. Where are the runs that score? What pitches thrown by this human rubbish? Son of Wrigley, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a team of broken retreads playing where the sun beats and the dead ivy gives no shelter, Jim Enright no relief, and the vendor no sound of beer, only there is baseball in this old park. Come, watch baseball in this old park and I will show you something different from... Oh, yeah. The dome at Houston rising above you, or the fans at Philly looking to beat you. I will show you grass and a team that is bust. Two, a game, more or less. The bench we sat on, like a worn out bar peeled in the bleachers where the scoreboard held up the standards wrought of gray steel and from which a pale scorekeeper peeped out. Another hid his paunch behind the clock, posted the score of seven games, candlestick reflecting the time upon the coast, as the zeros next to Cubs rose to meet defeat from cardinal runs poured in rich profusion. Yet there Jack Brickhouse filled all the TVs with inviolable voice, and still he cried, and still the outfielders pursued, hey, hey, to 30 years. And another withered stump of time, we sat in their green seats, staring forms, leaning out, leaning, jeering the team below. Footsteps shuffled on the base paths, over to Jesus, far to his left, Mitt ball throws, spread out in fiery points, rolled into center field, then we would be savagely booed. The Baron is bad today, yes, bad. Stay with the pitch, hit to left. Why can't Mercer hit to left, hit? What's Wallace waiting for? Why is he taking, why? I'll never know why he's always taking swing. Joe thinks we need a late rally, but I just want to go home. What is the score? The Cubs are down by four. What is the score now? What is the wind doing? Nothing again. Nothing. 
Can't they hit anything? Can't they feel anything? Do you remember 69? I remember Cardinals' eyelids stuck to their eyes. Play, you play. No, not it is something Lachman said, but oh, 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 Clive's overslid the bag. Tired for too many a win for Denny. What shall we do now? What shall we do? We shall go out for a beer and have a beer with our heads down low. What shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The game starts at 1.30, and if it rains, a pass at the door. And we shall see a game, more or less, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for the Cubs to maybe score. <laughs> Why I don't write about baseball or gambling. In short, I don't do either. I know I'm supposed to like baseball, the metaphoric game of life in which everyone just wants to go home. And someone's always trying to steal and not get caught and someone else is always calling the shots and we, each of us, have our chance up at the plate and some of us muff it, and some of us knock it out of the park, but more of us have lesser successes. We make it to first, second, though I've heard that it is easier to hit a homer than a triple. We have all heard about the people who were born on third base, imagine the mess, and think that they have hit a triple. It's called white privilege. But I don't really like baseball. The last time I was at a game, I brought a book and read it. I do enjoy gambling, though. Gambling with an O. You know, frisking, cavorting, frolicking, larking about. Real gambling, with money and all, is way too risky for me. I like to be in bed by nine. And I have never learned when to fold them when to walk away and when to run. I just keep holding on to those damn cards until they disintegrate my hands. But I do my share of flying without a net. I've done that plenty, mostly as a result of poor planning or having no plan at all or not realizing that I was supposed to have one. And it doesn't turn out all that well, not at all. But you know what? I always, always, have good stories. It's good to be here. Don Evans invited me last year. I got up here, uh, said a few words about the Sean of And uh, here we are with the uh, fifth incarnation, I think, the, the Swan of Meter. We're back to the track in a shortstop. He's, uh, someone talked about a lot of zeros, and I think we got a lot of zeros going on this. Anyways. I uh, Don had I had seen Don do a lot of spoken word stuff and our friend Randy Richardson. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I could try this myself. And so I worked up a little thing and a workshop it tonight. And uh, I'm gonna call it uh, Dusty's cardboard sign. So, anyways, um, anyways, uh, so my daughter. We're probably all into the you know the U of I basketball team, the Elite Eight, you know, so my daughter just graduated from U of I, and, and oh, Dusty's yeah. son, yeah, Dusty's son is a sophomore U of I, so he's kind my of, my son a, Dusty, is Dusty <laughs> Don, did, did I say Dusty, I, yeah, Don's son Dusty is a, uh, U of I, he's, he's a sophomore, he's like, so he's like halfway through, right, yeah, almost, yeah. so I'm like kind of a, I'm in the future here, and I'm thinking maybe I can give Don some advice, you know, fatherly advice, because he's, I've had the experience and he's kind of like learning the ropes here. So uh, my thought would be, I, I, I'm envisioning Dusty coming to Don, maybe he's graduated from college and he's got his first job, right? And I imagine Dusty coming up to Don going, Dad, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about going to like 40 or 50 games this year in the bleachers and tracking some player that I really, really love. What do you think? 
And you know, Don's first knee jerk reaction would probably be like, a oh, Dusty, listen, these are your prime earning years. You gotta work hard, you gotta network, you gotta start making a living. This is your career you gotta work on. Now I'm just gonna like tell Don, like just to lay off the gas here, maybe, maybe let him do his thing because if he doesn't give Dusty this chance, Dusty may never have an opportunity to be like in a bar in Cincinnati with his Dusty's cardboard sign, right? A bunch, bunch of Cincy fans ripping out of his hands. They try to run out of the bar and the Cub fans rally and they grab this guy and they rough him up and they bring back Dusty's cardboard sign right to Dusty. Or maybe there's a time where he's in Philly. He's in the upper deck, right? These four football-sized Philly fans rip the sign out of Dusty's hands. They throw Dusty's cardboard sign over the upper deck railing and Dusty's got to go down after the game, grab the ushers and go behind the left field fence and get Dusty's cardboard sign back. Or maybe there's a time where Dusty's in, let's say, San Francisco after game two of the National League Championship Series. He's walking through the airport. He sees Rick Russell comes and approaches him. This is the night after Rick Russell gets absolutely shelled for seven runs in the second inning and they have to pull him out. Rick Rush, like, let's say Rick Rush comes up to Dusty and says, Hey, Dusty, is that Dusty's cardboard sign? And Dusty goes, Well, yes, Rick Rush, this is Dusty's cardboard sign. And then Rick Rush goes, Man, that is so awesome. That is the coolest thing. And you can see him getting all wishful and nostalgia about being a cub. And he goes, Did the Cubs pay for you to come out here? How did you get here? And then Dusty goes, No. I'm just a really big fan. Or imagine 35 years into the future, the object of Dusty's love and passion gets inducted into the Cubs Hall of Fame, and that player invites Dusty into the Cubs skybox for two games, and Dusty gets to hang out with his family and his wife and his kids and his friends from grade school. And then at the end, right before they take the picture, instead of saying, smile, they all say, Dusty's cardboard sign. Now, if, 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 if Don were to discourage Dusty from saying, no, you got to study and work hard, he never would have had that light. So think about it, Don. <laughs> I kind of botched it at the end. I kind of botched it at the end, but workshop. Um, I used to sit at the kitchen table with my grandfather. My grandfather was a very gregarious guy and was captain of the softball team, um, the bowling league, and every other thing that was going on. Plus, he was, I think he was a bookie or something, but I wasn't sure about that. <laughs> and, he, and he had this mysterious look that would come over his face when he was writing. I thought, God, this must be something fantastic with a, pen, a pencil in this book. And so I didn't really realize he was keeping track of averages and things like that. But he started me writing in these little books alongside of him. And as a result, I kept going. And um, I suppose much to my father's chagrin, who was a major Cubs fan and is a brick in the wall at this point, may he rest in peace. Um, I didn't keep up with all the baseball things. And it was always, the game was always on, always on in the house. and I. I had to escape and go to the library most of the time to study because I didn't know what was going on. It was always on. My father and my brothers were screaming at the TV or at the radio at that point, and I was like, I get on my bike and ride out of here. So, um, but tonight, so that's my story with baseball. But um, I'm going to read Baseball Canto by uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, which was written in 1973. Uh, so some of the references you'll understand because of the time period here, but um, this is about, yeah, so this is Lawrence Ferlinghetti's take on baseball. Watching baseball, sitting in the sun, eating popcorn, reading Ezra Pound, and wishing that Juan Marichal would hit a hole right through the Anglo-Saxon tradition in the first canto and demolish the barbarian invaders 
when the San Francisco Giants take the field and everybody stands up for the national anthem with some Irish tenor's voice piped over the loudspeakers and all the players struck dead in their places and the white umpires like Irish cops in their black suits and little black caps pressed over their hearts, standing straight and still, like at some funeral of a bar Blarney bartender and all facing east as if expecting some great white hope or the founding fathers to appear on the horizon like 1066 or 1776. But, Willie Mays appears instead in the bottom of the first, and a roar goes up as he clouts the first one into the sun and takes off like a footrunner from Thebes. The ball is lost in the sun, and maidens wail after him as he keeps running through the Anglo-Saxon epic. And Tito Fuentes comes up looking like a bullfighter in his tight pants and small pointy shoes and the right field bleachers go mad with Chicanos and Blacks and Brooklyn beer drinkers. Tito, sock it to him, sweet Tito. And sweet Tito puts his foot in the bucket and smacks one that don't come back at all and flees around the bases like he's escaping from the United Fruit Company <laughs> as the gringo dollar beats out the pound and sweet Tito beats it out like he's beating out usury, not to mention fascism and anti-Semitism. And Juan Marichal comes up and the Chicano bleachers go loco again as Juan bells the first ball out of sight and rounds first and keeps going and rounds second and rounds third and keeps going and hits pay dirt. To the roars of the grungy populace as some nut presses the backstage panic button for the tape recorded national anthem again to save the situation. But it don't stop nobody this time in their revolution round the loaded white bases in this last of the great Anglo-Saxon epics in the Territoria Libra of baseball. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of time to read.